Hello, hello everyone. Hi, uh, welcome to the RISE webinar. My name is Chapa Setole and I'm the project manager at RISE International. I'm with my co-host today, Rizipi Moko. Reds, hi. Teddy, hi everybody on the webinar. My name is Rizipi Moko, and I'm the co-host of this webinar. Uh, looking forward to speaking to everyone that will be joining and that's already in the meeting. Awesome, awesome. Uh, thank you so much um, uh, for uh, joining us for today's webinar. Now, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, RISE is a nonprofit social enterprise that operates in Lesotho, a landlocked country in South Africa. We focus on economic development through job creation, skills development, and entrepreneurship, specifically in the built environment through a fellowship program called INLOCO. This is a design, built, and develop, and uh, entrepreneurship program uh, for graduates who have studied architecture, construction management, civil and electrical engineering. Get a hands-on learning experience while at the same time solving problems in infrastructure. We turn job seekers into job creators um, while, uh, at, at the same time helping them start their own businesses and taking them through a three-year incubation program where we connect them with mentors, co-working space, tools, clients, and other resources. Now, uh, I just wanted to know for us today, um, because we'll be focusing on ethics and values in architecture and construction. Um, we all know that you know, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, you know, they go a long way to setting a wide range of aspirational objectives and targets. But for construction industry professionals, um, it, is, it is rather an abstract uh, reference. You know, they presume and are intended to support or sustain populations, urban and economic growth. Their targets relate mostly to improvements. For example, uh, goal 11, which is for sustainable communities and cities, uh, states that by 2030, um, you know, cities should be able to provide that safe and accessible and uh, affordable environment for all in order to improve the uh, road safety and expand uh, public spaces and public transport, as well as, you know, attend to the needs of those uh, who are in vulnerable situations, uh, to attend to women, to attend to children, to attend to people with uh, disabilities and older persons. But back on the ground, we all know intuitively at least that um, improved self-sufficiency, clean energy, use of local produce, reduced consumption, uh, to, you know, which means to stop buying so much stuff, reduced waste, uh, recycling and cutting out uh, the weekends in other areas, you know, have some positive effect. But there are picket fences against the tornado of global development. Um, these super tallest buildings, you know, which use a lot of energy, hydrogen powered cars, electrical uh, cars, you know, um, all of this, you know, cause an effect around us and around the environment as well. The busiest sustainable airport in the world won't reduce flying. Um, you know, these industries, they, de they do need to grow to survive and their supply chains are vast and far reaching. But one question remains, do they practice ethics to ensure environmental sustainability? Today, we talk to Elisa Angel, um, who is an architect and co-founder of London-based practice Citizen Architects. She grew up in Germany and Eswatini and, his, and uh, has lived in South Africa, Botswana, and the United Kingdom. As well as being an architect, she, she holds a postgraduate diploma in development practices from Oxford Brookes University. For many years, Elisa designed schools and other community buildings with Walters and Cohen architects in London. She has worked with Peter Rich Architects in Johannesburg and designed and, and uh, project managed a youth center in Botswana for architecture for humanity. In 2014, she set up Citizen Architects with Richard Hadley. The practice specializes in community interest projects and community engagement in London and Sub-Saharan Africa. Recently, Citizen Architects completed a shelter and training facility for homeless young mothers in Accra and co-designed a public square with the community in London. In 2020, uh, Elisa was a member of the jury for Green City Kigali, um, a new neighborhood to be designed and built in Rwanda. Elisa has extensive experience in delivering community projects in complex environments, those impacted by developments and understanding the underlying power structures that architects operate within. Elisa also teaches at the University of Arts and Design in Linz, Austria. 
She also teaches on ethics and architectural practice at the Royal, at the Royal Institute of British Architects as part of their continued professional development program. Hello, Alisa, and welcome to our RISE webinar. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. And thank you particularly also to RISE International for asking me to speak. Um, I, I'm going to speak about ethics and values today in architecture, but also more widely in professional life and in the whole of the building um, industry. Um, and I'm hoping it'll be interesting, I'm hoping it'll be informative, and I'm hoping it'll be useful. Let me start off by talking a little bit about myself, because um, as you will see, I have not brought you today the definitive answers about what is ethical practice and what is not ethical practice, but rather a framework for considering how to make ethical decisions. And the ethical decisions that we do make are very much usually informed by who we are as people. They're informed by our value systems, by our beliefs, um, by our cultural upbringing, by the community we were raised in, by our life experiences. Um, so that's why I think it might be interesting to just talk a little bit about what brought me here today. I um, am a practicing architect. Um, I'm a founding director of Citizen Architects in London, in the UK. Um, but I was raised in Germany and also in Eswatini. So I went to school in Eswatini in the mid 1990s, um, around the time that Nelson Mandela became president of South Africa. So really exciting time to be there. Um, and this for me started a lifelong engagement with your part of the world. So I've got a very long standing sort of relationship with Southern Africa. So that's one thing I think is important to know about me. As I said, I'm an, I'm an architect. I've got a specialism in development practices. So I hold a postgraduate degree in development practices, which is a discipline that looks particularly at how to design together with communities, how to engage with communities, but also on how to work in maybe slightly more complex contexts. So for example, post-conflict situations, um, situations of uh, grave poverty, for example, or in places where there's very poor infrastructure in terms of the construction industry. Um, in my practice at Citizen Architects, we specialize in social interest projects and we work on those both in the UK, mostly in London, and also in Sub-Saharan Africa. So as one example, a recent project we had in Ghana um, was that we worked together with a UK-based charity and a Ghanaian charity um, to deliver housing for um, young mothers who were living on the streets in Accra, and it's a charity that provides them with accommodation, medical care, um, postpartum um, uh, assistance, um, but also trains them in a variety of different crafts in order to establish livelihoods for them um, and hopefully enable them to not go back to living on the streets in Accra, but instead build new livelihoods for themselves. So that's the kind of project we work on. But we've also recently worked on a redevelopment of a public square in London, where we work very closely with community um, members to establish what kind of new square they wanted. Um, and a big part of that was also bringing community together and um, a certain amount of conflict resolution within that community as well. So our work is quite varied, very interesting, I find. Very often throws up a whole lot of ethical questions. Um, Aside from that practice work, I'm also a trustee at Architecture for Humanity UK. Um, so we are a charity who gives architectural um, services to communities not otherwise able to afford them. And I also teach, um, currently I'm teaching at the Arts University in Linz, that's in Austria. And I teach on a design module that is delivered together with the University of Botswana. So we work together with students from Botswana and to the University in Linz on design projects. I have a particular interest in community engagement, um, obviously in ethics and practice. Um, and I have also very recently um, been teaching at the RIBA, so I lecture on behalf of the Royal Institute of British Architects. Um, and that is where the content for today's lecture comes from. Um, so what you are hearing today is very much what architects in the UK will be hearing or have heard. Um, the RIBA has recently established ethics or ethical practice as one of their core competencies. So this is something that that organization in the UK is taking very, very seriously. 
Um, so I'm hoping that what I'm sharing with you today will be useful in your context as well. And I look forward to hearing um, how you find it, whether it's applicable to your work. So let's have a look. Um, so the framework that I'm introducing today, as I said, we're not talking about um, definitive answers on what's ethical and what's not ethical. Um, it's just a way of categorizing issues as they arise. Um, maybe a way of helping you to attach different values to different um, different issues as they arise, being able to make uh, decisions in terms of prioritizing different issues. Um, and it is what is known as a duty-based system of ethical thinking. So it's not really generated out of, for example, a faith-based system or value-based system, but it's saying very clearly there are certain duties that you have as someone working in the construction industry. Um, and those duties may or may not be in conflict. You will be asked to make value judgments on those. Um, but you are asked to consider all of these duties when you make decisions. Um, in some ways, I find it's also quite a useful checklist. It's a way of sort of saying, have I considered every ethical implications of what I'm about to do? So let's have a look at the duties. I think it's much easier when you see them. Um, so here we go. We have, uh, we're looking at six different duties. Um, and they really very much work outwards from the very large scale issues inwards to the very personal. So we start off with the duty to the wider world. That's, we're talking about the environment. We're talking about everything that is outside of, of human habitation on this planet. We're talking about the duty to society and the end user. The duty to the client, that is one that I would say it sort of sits right in the middle of this duty-based system. Um, and it's also something that usually people think of maybe first when I think about what is your duty as a professional. Very often we think this is mostly about the people we have a contractual relationship with. The fourth duty is the duty to those in the workplace. And we'll see that this can mean different place, different kind of workplaces, different sort of people. Um, the duty to the profession. In my case, that's a duty to architecture and the architectural profession, but in your case, it might be uh, something else. It might be engineering, it might be a particular trade. And then finally, it's the duty to yourself, you as a person. Um, let's go through them one by one and try and illustrate a little bit what I mean when I talk about these duties. The duty to the environment, as I said, is really the duty to the natural world. Um, this is a duty that I would say we should all take particularly seriously, not just currently, always, but right now, we're really at a point as a species where I think unless we start taking this duty very, very seriously, um, the survival of the human species on this planet is not guaranteed. Um, because the climate emergency um, is real and it's urgent. Um, and it is very disproportionately and devastatingly felt by people in the global south. So that's including in Lesotho. Um, I probably don't need to say it, but this is an emergency that's been caused not by the young generation, not by young people in any part of the world. It's caused by my generation and the generations before, but even then not, not across the globe. This is something that's very much been caused by the global north and particularly rich people in the global north. So the graph on the left, um, I've sort of plotted some World Bank data, this dates back to 2019, when it's current enough. Um, and what it shows is CO2 emissions per capita, capita for different countries. Um, and I've selected some countries that I thought might be relevant here. So there's my country that I was born in that I mostly grew up in, Germany. Top line, you can see um, the CO2 emissions of German um, in the 1990s were about 12 tons per, um, per, per, per year per capita. Um, and since then, that's been declining slowly, um, but obviously nowhere near fast enough. We still emit a lot more carbon than anyone in the global in the global south. Right at the bottom, you can see Lesotho, a very low carbon emissions, um, and that's pretty much constant. Uh, so in terms of impact, in terms of causing this climate crisis, um, the fault very much lies in the global north and very much lies with rich 
uh, with rich countries. You can also see how countries that have maybe a bigger economy obviously have higher CO2 emissions. Um, so that's why you see South Africa, for example, um, actually rising quite steeply from the 1990s. Um, um, and, then, and then also China, obviously, um, a very much growing economy um, with, with rising emissions, really. Um, but no matter how we got to where we are, this is an emergency that will have to be solved by all of us together very quickly across the globe. So if there's something that I believe very, very strongly in, it's global collaboration, and which is also why I'm excited to talk to you. And I think we need to talk to each other. The only way we're going to solve this is not one one person, it's not one country, it's not one profession, it's everyone together, all hands on deck. And it is one of those things where I think there's no being neutral on this issue. You're either part of the solution or you're part of the problem. Um, so how do we become part of the solution? First off, I think it's really important to, to know your own agency and to know where your greatest impact can be. Um, so the construction industry is responsible for nearly 40% of global carbon emissions. You've probably heard this figure before. So on the left-hand side, you can see carbon emissions by sector. And if you take building operations and building materials and construction together, we've got a huge impact. So what does this mean? It means that the impact that you can have in your line of work is infinitely greater than the impacts you can have as an individual. And this graph, this goes even more so for someone in this too, because your CO2 emissions on a personal level are so very small anyway. So where you can really make a change is in your work. So one way of looking at this is thinking, oh, my God, I work in a terribly polluting industry. This is terrible. I should try and get out. And another way of looking at it is to say, this is where I have agency. This is where I can change the world. This graph on the left, I think, is really interesting. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go through it because I'm sure you can't read the tiny writing on it. This is a study that um, a firm of architects in the UK did in 2016. They were trying to find out where the greatest impact was. So what they did was... They calculated their office um, CO2 emissions. So this is their entire to run their entire office, their workspace per year. Um, and they calculated what the CO2 emissions for that were. That's the tiny little red dot right at the top. So if you look at the top one, that's how much carbon they were emitting in a year. The second dot along is they asked all of their employees to calculate their carbon footprint in their personal life for the year. So that's the transport they took to get to work, but also to go on holiday, their flights, the, the food they were eating, the clothes they were buying, all of that together makes up the yellow dot, which I hope you can see. It's the second one along, a little bit bigger. Then they looked at the operational carbon footprint of one of the larger projects for the year. So what, as you can see, the blue dot, bigger still. So the carbon emissions of one of their office buildings that they were building much bigger than either or the combined of their personal emissions. The big red dot is the embodied carbon of that same project. So this is how, what kind of carbon emissions went into building that project in the first place. Um, and then finally, the dot that does not fit on the screen because it is far, far too big is the pink at the bottom. So you can see just the curve at the top there. And that's the embodied and operational carbon of all of their projects for the year. So what you can see there really, what this is telling you is that where your power lies is in your work life. Um, so that can be, I would say that's empowering. That's scary, but that's also empowering. So how can we use this power? Um, by doing all the things that I'm sure you you talk about all the time as well. Um, and you know, they're, they're fairly simple things, but it's just about being, strategic and remembering to do them. So it's about using resources wisely, um, including reusing buildings where possible rather than demolishing them and building new ones. It's about using non-toxic, low carbon and local materials, materials that haven't been shipped halfway across the globe. Um, it's about being very precise and measuring carbon emissions during the construction, the use and the demolition of the buildings that you design. Um, and then designing places that enable other people to live good, low impact lives. Um, so thinking when you think, when you build a building about what kind of community does this create? Um, can people live and work in the same place? Um, what does this new development mean for people's lifestyles? 
It's about incorporating regenerative design principles. So going beyond zero carbon, beyond saying we're going to try and tread very lightly on the earth. Instead, it's about saying, can this building, can this development do something to actually make this planet healthier and regenerate? Um, very often our life, our work is about educating our clients and the design teams and challenging their objectives and their briefs. You have a voice in design team meetings and it really doesn't matter which profession you work in. If you're in a design team meeting or you're on site and you see something where you think there would be a better way of doing this or this is a terrible way of doing things, using your voice, being able to speak as a professional can have a huge impact. Um, we need to also start carrying out research and we need to make information available to others to help them fight climate change. Um, as, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. For me, this is not the time to hold on to knowledge and say, this is my competitive advantage. This is the time to share. This is the time to say, I found a really good low impact way of doing something and shout it from the rooftop and give that information away. Um, I think because, because of the challenge and the scale, um, the scale of the challenge, I think we need to just um, work together. We need to share information. And then finally, outside of your project work, um, you can also lobby governments, lawmakers and professional bodies and say, we need stricter regulation. Actually, we don't want re deregulation. We want to set the bar higher. So all of those things are things that you can do in terms of this duty um, in, your, in your working life on a building site or in a design office. The second duty then is the duty to society. The duty to society is really about communities, about people that you don't have a direct um, contractual relationship with, but who will still be impacted by the developments that you work on. So what can we do for this duty? Um, one of the things we can do is just think very carefully about the project's wider impact. Um, so how does this impact the neighborhood? How does this new shopping mall, for example, impact the livelihood of the informal traders outside? How does it impact um, the people who drive the taxis who will come to this place? How does it, um, you know, how does how does the um, how does the, the wider neighborhood how is the wider neighborhood impacted by this um, by this development? It is their way of making this a positive rather than a negative impact. Um, very often you'll be the voice that can protect the rights of existing communities. Um, so we're especially thinking about people who are vulnerable to displacement and marginalization. We're talking about the poor, we're talking about disabled, we're talking about illegal migrants, um, the people who don't normally have a voice, wherever you feel their rights are being harmed by the work that you're involved with, I think it's your duty to speak up. Um, but how do we know how do you go about, for example, designing a place that's um, accessible and open, inviting for all? I, for me, a really important um, tool in the toolbox is to involve stakeholders in the design process. So not just think that you as a designer have all the answers, but instead go and ask people who are living on the site, who are using that site already, who will be using the site, um, talk to the shopkeepers, talk to the people in the neighborhood, um, and really try and find out how things are currently being done, how they could be done, how they could be done better. Um, it's about designing inclusive environments. Um, and I think this goes really beyond just making things wheelchair accessible, beyond saying people with disabilities need to be able to access this place. It's also about designing environments that are inviting. So very often people feel excluded without actually being physically excluded. I could, for example, go for young people who are often excluded from uh, new developments. Um, could be for old people in terms of um, the aged. Um, it could be people from different ethnic backgrounds. Um, but really designing spaces that, are, that bring people together rather than separate them. Really overall, it's about designing for those who are going to use the building in mind. So. Rather than just taking um, the client's brief as gospel, um, it's about challenging that brief. It's about thinking very clearly about who will actually be using this building, who, whose life am I impacting? With increasing urbanization, more and more people are spending the majority of their lives in the built environment and not in the natural environment. So we're really creating people's worlds here. We're not 
we're not just creating individual objects, we're creating environments that people live in. So we have a huge amount of power in that. Um, and finally, I would argue that you need to um, design spaces that are adaptable. Um, that can adapt to changing lifestyles, that can try and look into the future and um, and design buildings that will be able to um, cater for different different uses, um, different numbers of, of users. Um, and of course, we can't predict the future. That's why I think designing things that are good quality, robust and quite loose fit often works very well because it means that buildings can be used in different ways for different functions. And this is one, one of those examples where two duties really overlap. So if we can design something that doesn't have to be demolished in 10 years time because our lifestyles have changed or because the users have changed, then that's really fulfilling your duty to the, the environment as well. Third along is the duty to the client. As I said, that's the one where people usually have the clearest idea where they kind of think, okay, I think I know what this is. Very often this duty is, for example, um, uh, it's it's talked about in the contract documents as well. It's quite quite clearly defined what our duty is. But it goes beyond that, of course, as well. So our clients expect us to be conscientious and thorough, um, but they also expect us to be creative and innovative. Um, nobody hires a professional because they already know the answers. You're being hired because you are curious and because um, hopefully you'll be able to come up with new ideas, but also you'll be able to challenge and um, and and disrupt processes when appropriate. You need to be impartial, fair and incorruptible. So those things, for example, are very clearly defined in the Code of Conduct um, for architects in the UK as well. Um, so this, for example, goes into not specifying, you know, not taking a dinner invitation from a supplier because they hope that you will specify their product. That's one of those things. Um, because you need to have your client's best interest at heart. Um, and sometimes having their best interest at heart means interrogating their brief. It means challenging them, um, not just saying yes to everything they say, but actually being their kind of critical friend can also be having their best interest at heart. And then finally, it's about being empathetic. I think it's very much about um, not just taking a brief at face value and delivering that, that's the baseline. But I think if you go beyond that and you really kind of put yourself in the client's shoes, then you're much better placed to be put, uh, properly on their side and um, really act in their best interest. The fourth duty is the duty to the profession. So as I said, for me, this is the duty to the architectural profession. Um, but um, for each of you, this will be slightly different, but I think the principles still stand. One of the things is embodying professionalism. So in the UK, for example, as an architect, you can be struck off the register for having a criminal record. So every time you are charged with a crime, um, I mean, I say this like we get charged with crimes all the time. If an architect gets, um, charged for a uh, charge for a crime or even just investigated for a crime. Um, this goes before the architect's registration board and they decide whether or not this has essentially besmirched the the, the image of the profession. Um, you need to take responsibility. Um, so really kind of step forward and put yourself um, yourself out there in terms of taking responsibility for your actions. Um, I think your duty is also to advocate for positive change. As I said, we work in a very polluting industry. We also work in a very sexist industry. We work in an industry that in very in, a, in many, many ways um, has a lot of room for improvement. So advocating for that positive change also, I would say, falls under that duty. Um, I spoke a bit earlier about the need for sharing information, and that really is the duty to the profession as well. Um, we need to make our profession much better, much more quickly. Um, so if we have hit upon a particular good solution, I think it's time to share. Um, and for me, particularly teaching and mentoring the next generation of architects is something that I see very much as that duty. When I was a young architect um, or an architectural student and then a young architect, um, I had many mentors. I had employers who trained me on the job. 
who were very generous with their time, who didn't expect me to already know everything, um, who explained things patiently, who gave me responsibility and then checked my work. So all of those things, I think, um, really important. So with my business partner, Richard, for example, we try and do this all the time. Even if we're not in a position to give someone, if someone applies to us and we're not in a position to hire them, we will usually offer that they can come in, they can do a trial interview with us, we'll give them some feedback on their interview skills, um, we might give them some feedback on the portfolio, um, we give them some tips on who to apply to, um, and we give them a little bit of guidance of what they should expect from an employer to make sure that the um, bad practices in terms of exploitation that still exist in our profession um, stop. And that can only stop when young architects are well educated about their rights. So those are the sort of things that we do in terms of the right, um, the duty to the profession. Duty to those in the workplace. Um, in my line of work, um, it's really twofold. It's the duty to those people I work with in an office. And then it is the duty to those who work on the building sites that we're involved with. In terms of people who work in the offices um, and the design offices, um, I think a big part is really providing a good working environment. And a good working environment is one that's free of bullying, um, that's supportive, um, that nourishes the whole person. It doesn't, doesn't just um, try and extract as many hours of labor out of someone as possible, but really tries to sort of build them up as an individual. So that goes with encourage, encouraging and guiding staff. Um, as I said, for example, training as well. Um, uh, so something where I've in my life been very, very lucky, um, having been trained very well. Um, so those are the kind of environments that um, a staff member can expect to work in, uh, should should be able to work in. Um, but it's also the kind of environment that brings out the best in staff. And and I think actually in terms of in terms of your business also makes business sense. Um, you need to provide opportunities for training. Again, this is something that's good for the staff and it's also good for the business. Um, think really carefully together with the member staff about what it is that they need, where are the shortfalls, where do, where do they need to find out, where do you as practice need to find out more, how can you, how can you get that information, how can you invest in, in employees. Um, providing safety and security is obviously um, a kind of baseline. And on building sites, this is something that's, very important. Um, we um, we know that good protocols on site can save lives um, with the right working practices. Deaths on building sites and serious injury on building sites can be drastically reduced. Um, so that's really important. But it's also the the safety of of people on building sites in terms of safety from harassment and um, safety from from bullying, all of those things as well. So it's not just physical. Um, safety, but it's also your mental mental well-being, for example. And that meets me on to looking after your staff's health and well-being. Um, mental health is something that's become much, much bigger uh, subject in Europe, uh, particularly, but also I'm sure um, in Africa as well, through the pandemic, people's mental health has, has really taken a hit. Um, and people are much more aware that um, people need to be nourished, they need to be given a little bit of time to kind of um, regenerate as well. <clears throat> already said a little bit about the ensuring the safety of those working on building sites. Um, a big part of that is also modern day slavery, for example. So this is a, a huge issue, um, particularly on European building sites, um, but also in the Middle East, it's a huge problem. So this is often migrant labor um, who get trafficked across borders um, and are then in working environments where they're not working of their own free will. Um, and the employer has some kind of power over them, often to do with repaying presumed debt because they've been brought to a place to work. Often their papers have been taken away. Um, so while we think of something as sla slavery as something that happened a long time ago, it's actually something that's happening right now. And it's um, and the building industry is is one of the kind of hotspots of modern day slavery. So. We are all trained in the UK on how to spot this on a building site. If you see someone who's not making eye contact, who's not communicating with other people, um, if someone moves away when you pull out a camera and try to take a picture of a building site, that can be a sign if people's um, personal hygiene is poor. 
if they don't seem to have any possessions, um, if they're showing any sign of, of physical injury, all of those things are sort of red flags where you should really try and investigate. And no matter who you are on the building site, whether you're the architect, whether you're a fellow laborer, whether you are another professional working on the building site, whether you're an electrician or a carpenter or a bricklayer, if you suspect there's anything like that going on, it's your responsibility to take this issue further. So whether it is talking to the contractor, which might not be the best course of action because they might be involved in perpetrating this, or whether it is about talking to someone else in power or actually going to the authorities or even going to the police. Um, and then on the um, coming back to your working in your own in your in your own practice, whether that's an architectural practice or any other practice, um, your duty to your uh, the people in the workplace could also include things like very proactive kind of business measures, um, like offering your staff a stake in the company. So this is something that more and more practices are doing. They're actually making uh, their staff members part owners of, of the company, um, which can engender a much greater sense of ownership amongst staff. Um, and of course, it's also about providing equal opportunities. So regardless of people's gender, for example, the sexual orientation, uh, the ethnic backgrounds, to provide people with, with the same opportunities in a company. The final duty then, it's a duty to yourself. Um, and this is, this is one where most people struggle a little bit to think about what this might mean. Um, and I think also because this is something that's very, um, it's very personal in a way. Um, only you can define what your duty to yourself really means. Um, but I think it's an important thing to bear in mind. It's important to kind of think about, is this, is all of this work that I'm doing, is it still working for me as well? So the picture here is, it's a picture of me looking after myself, uh, duty to myself. I need to be out in nature very often. Um, and this is in the Alps. So I, yeah, for me personally, this means having the time to, um, get actually out of the built environment and into the natural environment. But let's have a look at what else this could mean. Um, due to yourself, for example, could be the freedom to explore your artistic vision um, and also the joy of creating beautiful things. Many of us got into design-related practices or construction-related practices because we're in love with making things. So, for example, a carpenter who has created a beautiful timber-framed building um, or a beautiful piece of fitted furniture will know that kind of sense of having accomplished something um, that sort of hits on the beauty spot, basically. And while some work that you're offered might pay better, we all know that being involved in something that you feel has a has a positive as a joyous outcome is something that's um that speaks to us as well so that could be something that's important to you for a lot of people um attaining fame and social status is really important so this is something that could potentially um be a driver for many architects we as a professional have a um uh, a reputation as being um the kind of lone genius um a little bit arrogant I, don't find that to be true in a lot of architects I spend time with, um, but it is something that drives still a lot of a lot of people in design professions as well. And of course, there's social social status um, connected to having a good education, connected to having a good job. Um, so all of those things are important. But at the more basic level, it is about earning a livelihood. And I don't know anyone who works in the construction industry who doesn't, for whom that is not important. And um, it is also important because we don't just rely, we don't not just earning a livelihood for ourselves, we're earning a livelihood for our families, for people who rely on us, um, for our second cousin who's going to school still, or for an elderly parent who needs financial support, um, or grown-up children who still need a little bit of help while they're going through their own education. All of those things um, are important. Um, and then finally, looking after your own physical and mental well-being. That's what the previous slide was about, really. That was me looking after both of those things. Um, we work in a very high-pressure environment um, because the construction industry deals with very expensive things. So for a lot of... Um, 
you're very often in a meeting where you're discussing a lot of money and the greater the threat that something might go wrong and that money might be lost, the more head up people get, the more aggressive they can get. It can also, as I said, be quite a male dominated environment. So um, without making any negative statements about that, I, I do think that it can often be a very aggressive, very conflict um, uh, rich environment. Um, so all of those things, I think we just need to make sure we also look after ourselves while we remember all of the other duties. So one more, one more idea I wanted to introduce to you, and this is really not directly from that duty um, based system, is, um, but it overlaps very nicely, not just because both um, diagrams are circles, it goes way beyond that. Um, you might be um, familiar with this concept already, you may not be. Kate Raworth is a, an economist um, from the UK. And she's developed something called donut economics, which I think is actually a really interesting and good way of thinking about how we interact with the world. This relates mostly to the duty to the environment and the duty to society, I would argue. Um, although it also straddles some of the other duties. The idea is that there's an ecological ceiling. So as a species, we are vastly overusing resources at the moment. Um, so we're overshooting over the ecological ceiling, so she calls it. And at the same time, somehow we're not providing sufficiently for the poorest in societies in a lot of places in the world. In fact, I wouldn't say there's a single country in the world where everyone is adequately provided for. So there's on the other end, so you see the, the smaller circle there, that's the social foundation. So what we're basically saying is the ecological ceiling um, is things like and the CO2 emissions, obviously, that everybody's always talking about, but it's also um, ocean acidification, ozone layer depletion, air pollution, biodiversity loss, land conversion, freshwater withdrawal, um, a chemical pollution, all of those things. Uh, we need to find a way of reducing that massively. And then at the same time, we need to find a way of providing for everyone in society so that everybody has food and water and energy and networks and housing and and also equality and social equity and a political voice and peace and justice and education, all of those things. So really that to me speaks very clearly to these duties we've just talked about. So it's really about all of us as a species trying to find that that kind of sweet spot where we're not using too much and at the same time we're giving enough. So how do you then apply all of this in practice? It's all very well and good, you know? We're talking about these things, um, but what worries me slightly sometimes is that ethics is mostly talked about in terms of um, dilemmas. So it's mostly about what do you do if, um, you know, someone comes and they ask you to design a nuclear power station or a prison or, whatever it is um or for example you see someone on the building site and you suspect it's modern day slavery or um you see someone passed over for promotion and you suspect it's because they're a woman or um you know you behave see someone behaving badly and you feel it reflects badly on your profession um or you see someone working themselves to the bone and not looking after the mental health so we very much talk about these duties usually as as these kind of moments where we come up against a particular um, a particular question, and then particularly when those duties are in conflict. So, for example, if I see that my client wants to maximize profit on a development, and um, at the same time, I can also see how this development is going to have a very negative impact on the people around it. So, for example, the developer very often in London. They're very keen to overdevelop, I would say. So they're wanting to build 15 stories instead of 10. And then uh, you have lower housing developments for poorer people surrounding this new development. And they're going to be completely overshadowed and have all of their views cut out just because the developer wants to um, uh, make a little bit more profit. So there you have, I would say, a conflict between the interest of 
your clients, so those commissioning services um, on the one hand, and the interests of wider society on the other hand. And you you are called upon to make a some sort of a value judgment on this and trying to think about what your agency might be in this particular situation. But more, almost more, more interestingly, I I think we should also think about how we can use these duties and these value systems as a way of um, really driving our work, being very proactive about how we approach these things. So I've done a little bit of an overlay over these duties um, to kind of think, okay, there's the different duties that the people have uh, and the, the entities that I have a duty to, um, but then there's different ways in which I can act. Um, we've talked a lot about project works. One of the axes here is project work. Um, that's, you know, how does this development affect people? How does it, you know, how does my work on an actual project affect all of these different duties? We talked a little bit about management. So when we talked about duty to those in the workplace, for example, is, you know, if, if people, if companies decide to give a stake in the company to one of their employees or several of their employees, that's a management decision. But I would say that's really on related to that duty. Then research and teaching, we talked a bit about data sharing to do with the climate emergency. So you could say that sharing research data on how to build low carbon buildings would be a duty to the wider world, for example. And then finally activism, if, if, you're, led, if you're lobbying um, your government to better control um, chemical uh, pollution in the building industry or excessive water use in the building industry, anything like that, that would fall under activism. So there's there's those sort of four ways in which we can become active across the different six different duties. Um, and then what I've tried to do, I've taken two different examples of architecture practices that I hope everybody's heard of, or most people might have heard of, and was thinking, you know, can I plot, can I use these, this to kind of show you how you might plot um, your own work, you know? So it's not really so much about judging other people, it's really about sort of thinking about your own work. Um, but I thought it might be useful to just use examples where you might be familiar with the people, so you know what I'm talking about. Francis Carré is someone who um, is obviously very famous, um, an architect I greatly admire. Um, and and especially in the context where I think African architects have been very sadly overlooked um, for far too long. So I think a really nice example of someone who's changing that. Um, so I tried to sort of plot onto this and think, okay, well, he's um, uh, in his project work, um, he's he's doing a lot for the wider, wider world, society, um, and for those working in the workplace. Um, and I'll explain a little bit later how I got there. Um, but then also research and teaching. He does a lot of teaching um, and actually a lot of research. So he's kind of really active in those two, um, uh, on those two axes. Now, I want to say beforehand that I don't have any particular insight into either this practice or the other practice I will talk about. This is entirely based on information that's in the public domain. Um, and I may well have got this wrong. I'm not claiming any um, particular authority on whether these people are good architects or not good architects, or whether that what they do is ethical. It's really just to try and demonstrate how to use the tool, basically. Um, so yeah, Francis Carré, an architect with um, offices in Berlin and in Gando in Burkina Faso. Um, so this is the um, picture of the pavilion that he built in London um, to a couple of years ago now. Beautiful pavilion. Um, and I was thinking, you know, with the project work that he does in Ghana, so he's, um, he was educated in Germany. That's why he's got a, a practice in, in Berlin. Um, but he works a lot in his, in his home place of Gando in Burkina Faso. Um, and with his project work, he uh, is involved in skills building and livelihood creation. So he's, he works very much with local people and upskills them in building um, in building skills. Um, he's thinking very hard about how to use traditional materials in new innovative ways. So how can we how can we take those ancient skills and make them really useful in today's society? Um, in doing this, he's shaping contemporary vernacular architecture in Burkina Faso. Um, 
and I think really making a very um, valuable contribution to um, the profession across Africa. When I teach in Botswana, um, Francis Garay is, a, you know, a example um, precedent project for every second architecture students I speak to as someone who's greatly admired there. Um, and he's really kind of giving people the confidence that this is something that um, a vernacular architecture that can be very rooted in its place and still be very contemporary um, and very um, seen as very beautiful, have a high profile, you know, that there's not just one way of designing and building. Um, he's great at knowledge sharing through teaching and writing and exhibitions and lectures. And I've been to one of his lectures and he's a really inspiring public speaker. Um, and and through all of this, he's really raised the profile of Af African architects globally. So I think that's, you know, that's a real duty to the profession as well. So that's one example. The second example I'm going to talk about, and this is just because I wanted to say, when we talk about impact, we're not just talking about necessarily positive impact. So a little bit, like I said, with regards to the duty to the wider world, we're not, um, we're not always just part of the solution. Sometimes we're part of the problem. And actually, unless we think about it carefully, chances are we'll be more part of the problem than we are part of the solution. Um, and so I've also looked at another practice, which is basically maybe not quite as um, value driven as Francis Carey, um, also much, much larger, much more commercially um, successful practice. Zaha Hadid Architects um, based in London. And Zahadid, you may all be familiar, I'm not sure. Zahadid herself passed away a few years ago very unexpectedly. Um, but yeah, she was a, um, a woman architect who um, really rose to uh, global fame, um, I would say in the early 2000s, probably, and, um, and has left a legacy of a very large commercial, very successful practice. And... I try to plot a little bit now in terms of um, green dots for very actively positive impact, but then also pink dots where I'm thinking there's been a lot of controversy. Um, you know, people have questioned whether the impact of that particular practice um, can be can be really quite negative. So that kind of both all of those go across research and teaching, project work, um, and, and and kind of management. Um, so if you are not familiar with the name Zahadid, you might be familiar with the kind of look of her buildings, very sculptured, very often very kind of beautifully shaped, um, almost space agey buildings, um, uh, a very, very strong, striking artistic vision. Um, so Zahadid spent a good 10 years or so before she built her first building, um, really just producing unbuilt work. So a lot of competition entries, a lot of paintings, drawings, um, and they always had that vision. And I think people doubted at the beginning that this is an artistic vision that could actually be built. And and I think a lot of the allure has also come from the fact that almost these impossible structures get built. Um, as I said, she was very an extremely successful architect. Um, very good at building a brand, very good at breaking through social barriers as you do with, you know, as much as African architects have been overlooked, female architects have also been overlooked. Um, and I think that is changing and, and Zahadid is, you know, it's a lot of credit should go to Zahadid for changing some of that. So she's, she's really in the era when there were these star architects, stars that were architects, in the 90s and early 2000s, um, she was the female star architect. You know, that's really, there wasn't really anyone else who was a woman and also playing at that level, commanding those sort of fees, getting those kind of commissions. She was the first woman to win the Pritzker Prize in architecture, which is kind of the greatest prize you can win in architecture in the UK. Um, so all of those things, I think, are really positive. Um, and she's done a huge amount for our profession. And she's obviously also the duty to herself. I think she really is someone who managed to fulfill her artistic vision and then also do well for herself financially. But on the other hand, um, after she passed away, um, as I said, very unexpectedly, there's been a lot of very ugly 
wrangling about her legacy, about the money, about who inherited she didn't have children. So who does the money go to? Um, a lot of fighting between the company and her business partner or kind of second in command. Um, there was a lot of controversy about workers' rights. Um, so she very controversially said that um, the the physical well-being of build of um, of workers on the building sites that she was working for, I think in Qatar, um, were not her responsibility, which is actually neither legally nor nor morally true. I would argue. Um, so there were a lot of people dying on the, her building sites, and um, she wasn't really taking, or they as a company weren't really taking action. Um, there's been a lot of, and this is actually something where I do have a little bit of of insider knowledge. I've got friends who've worked for her, and I think the working conditions within the office were um, really borderline abusive, um, both in terms of how people were talked to, but also the build, the, the hours that people worked. Um, and I would say really not giving back to young people in the profession, but instead sort of using their um, their skills and talent without giving proper credit and proper training. Um, she's been criticized for the type of commissions she's accepted, um, the people she's worked with and for her clients. Um, so all that kind of difficult. Um, and then also people from within her practice, not necessarily herself, um, have made very, um, controversial statements about public space and private space and about whether or not architects have a duty to uh, create equitable societies or whether it's really just about who pays the biggest dollar. Um, so a mixed picture. And without wanting to take anything away from her fame and fortune, I just think it's an interesting thing to look at and to think about, um, about how we can have a negative impact as well as a positive impact and how to ward against the one and and kind of really proactively walk towards the other. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful I've been able to present to you and I hope it was a little bit useful. I hope it was interesting. I hope it might be, uh, give you something in the future in your work. So thank you very much. All right, all right. Um, just, uh, just to, also latch on to that um, you did talk about uh, duties in the workplace and you know uh, I guess as being the one running the practice being aware of uh, what is happening uh, amongst your staff your junior staff and making sure everybody's well-being and health is being uh, taken care of um, but uh, knowing that we're involved in the construction industry uh, when it gets to the construction site and when it is about the construction or the laborers or you did mention about making the design simple enough for people to build but um i want to say that on site the the ethics kind of you know yeah. uh, go out of the window <laughs> so <laughs> how would how would uh construction managers or laborers actually uh be aware of their uh, their rights or maybe or uh, mm. ethical principles that they should follow uh in that environment i think the problem you're, you're hitting on a really interesting subject there because i think the people who are most at risk on building sites are usually the ones who are most disenfranchised so i think people with professional training um like yourselves are very aware of these issues and they're aware of uh their rights and um they have a voice in a different way to, for example, day laborers who get hired for hard manual labor that doesn't require any prior training, I think are often not aware of their rights. And when you, um, you know, so I've been on building sites where then you see people sort of with a pickaxe digging a trench wearing flip flops. And, you know, you look at it and you think, well, I know that's unsafe. I can see that's unsafe. Um, and I'm sure the person doing it knows it's unsafe, but there's, they don't feel they have the voice to say, I need adequate side protection boots, for example, to do this work. Um, so it's really, you know, I think there's, there's a limited maybe amount that those people right at the bottom of the food chain are able to do because they need the work and need to take it on. So it's important that everyone else who's a little bit has more of a voice bands together in order to protect the most vulnerable on a building site. And that, for example, includes also modern day slavery is a huge issue on large construction sites where 
you have people working on sites who uh, are often trafficked from different areas, from different countries, um, and are essentially bonded labor. And it's important that we all remain vigilant about this. I'm not sure whether this is a problem in Lesotho in the same way. It might not be as prevalent there, but it's very prevalent in Europe and especially in the Middle East, it's a huge problem. And there's training and there are guidelines for how to spot this sort of thing going on on building sites. So uh, for example, if you see, mm -hmm. if, people, if people work on building sites and they don't communicate with anyone else, they seem very reluctant to talk to anyone. Um, they have poor personal hygiene, they look stressed, they look malnourished, they have obvious signs of having been physically abused. All of those things are signs that they may be um, essentially slaves. Um, and then it really is for everyone, you know, in this case goes for whether you're an electrician or you're an architect or whoever you are, if you suspect something like that going on, you have to take action and you have to take, um, and whether it is going to the construction company and raising the issue, whether it's going to the client and raising the issue, or whether it's going to outside um, agencies, including law enforcement, I think we have a responsibility in that, in that way, yeah. All right, all right. I think uh, we do have uh, the, the construction sites are not as bad um, as um, mm. uh, modern day slavery, but they they do tend to flirt with the line of uh, uh, unethical <laughs> practice. <Yeah. laughs> but uh, I don't know uh, if Teddy there is a question in the comment box or on Facebook. Otherwise, um, in the interest of time, I'll have maybe two last questions uh, before closing because uh, the webinar is uh, supposed to run just for an hour during lunch time. So, Teddy, are there any other questions from people in the in the webinar or oh, on Facebook? No, no, there haven't been any questions so far. Okay. Been okay. Any questions yet? Okay, uh, then I suppose the next question from me, Elisa, is um, last month we had a lecture uh, where we we're discussing how architecture and design in school is most often the not, uh, the theory stays kind of in school and it's not replicated in practice. And then we learned that architects have to think uh, with the end user in mind. So if you were to design a mall, uh, the same thing applies. Uh, how sure can we be that our ideas are relevant for the end users or are those merely uh, an interpret interpretation of uh, of their needs? Yeah. <laughs> a very good question, <laughs> a constant quest <laughs> for the architect. Yeah. Um, I, I believe very firmly that we need to involve people without an architectural training much more in the design of buildings because I think we have very specific skills that relate to translating requirements um, uh, into physical form. And I think that's really where our strength lies, is in the creation of spaces. And also in interpreting people's desires and, um, and requirements um, into a good brief. So I think we are, we are particularly skilled at writing briefs and at designing buildings. But we don't have the answer to everything. Um, and very often your client representative doesn't have the answer to everything either. Um, so, for example, if you were building a mall, I think it would be really important to not just talk to whoever's financing the mall, but actually do very in-depth consultation with, for example, the people who are going to run the shops within the mall, the people who are going to use the mall. So the local community, who's going to use this? You know, what do they want? How do they... Um, how do they operate in this space? But then also the wider community around that. So you'd be looking at, as I said, you know, if you're if you've got shopkeepers nearby, they're going to be impacted by this development. So it's much better to get them on site and an, and integrate them somehow into this new development. Um, so it's kind of trying to cast your web as widely as possible to speak to as wide a range of people as possible. Um, and you need to be quite creative sometimes about how you involve those people. So for example, if you're building a mall in Lesotho, I would imagine that if Lesotho, I haven't personally, I'd love to come to Lesotho, I haven't been yet, but I imagine that there are certain similarities between Lesotho and Eswatini and, and uh, South Africa. And there's a lot of informal traders, for example. Um, when you're designing a mall, I think it'd be very important to talk to informal traders. It'd be very important to talk to minibus drivers, for example. There's always near malls. There's always lots of local transport. Um, so you'd need to talk to them about how does this work for them and their business. Um, so it's 
for me, it's mostly about recognizing the limits of our own profession um, and really help people interpret um, their desires in architectural form, but not overstepping the line, but telling them how to live. Okay, okay. Uh, I think that's, that really answers it. And for you coming to the Soto, I think it's a duty to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, to make sure you... duty to myself. No, absolutely. Yeah. So I hope on my next yeah. trip down to Southern Africa, I'll be able to make it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, time has run out, but I'm just going to ask one last question. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, whether a coal or power station could be a sustainable project. And maybe if I bring it back to the context of Lesotho, where we have um, a lot of water, so we build uh, big uh, dams as water catchments, and those could be uh, detrimental to the environment. But you know uh, they serve the public and then it becomes yeah. an economic benefit to to the government and the country at large so now how how does one uh, understand the ethics around um, such large projects that yeah uh, it, of that nature yeah it's it's so difficult i had conversations with friends in south africa who say you know we've got coal to last us for the next 40 years or whatever it is, I, don't, I can't remember the figure, but um, you know, we've got we've got lots of coal. We have huge problems with power supply. Um, you know, we need to use this coal because we have it. And and it's not fair for the global north to create a climate crisis and then come and tell us that we can't burn the coal. And there's for sure, I can, you know, I understand, I see the argument. And I think that's a really, that's the really difficult a um, uh, question that we're grappling with globally at the moment is that um, there has to be the economic support for less wealthy nations to pivot towards clean energy. I think personally, because I think the, the, the climate emergency is now so real and so urgent, I think any more coal power plants I just, I don't think it's possible. Like, I think as, as far as our survival as a species on this planet is concerned, I just think we cannot have any more. And I say this as a German, we're just building more coal mines. I mean, it's it's shocking. Um, so, you know, and then who who is Europe to tell Africa not to do this? Um, but I think there are certain things like coal power plant for me is one of those things where I would say, we just cannot do this anymore. Um, and we need to think about ways of generating energy more cleanly. There are other ones, like I, tr I tried to use the example of, of an airport earlier. I think they're not as clean cut. You know, that in a way, a coal power plant is quite an, is an, is an easier question, I think. Um, you yeah, know, for yeah. example, can you design, I, I talked to an American architect who is trying to run a petition for architects not to get involved with building prisons in America because people get executed in prisons and that's against human rights convention. So he's sort of saying that's the ultimate human rights abuse and these architects should not be complicit in this. So it, there's always a question of like, where do you try and change things and where do you walk away? And that's very much a personal decision. You know, or sometimes we have to take a decision as a, as a community, as a, as a profession and say, we don't work on these sort of projects. Okay, so these, these issues are not very much clear Mm. And yeah, I kind of see what the, what the standard is here. I think what I was trying to say, and I hope that's come across a little bit in the talk, is that it's, a, it's just a framework of thinking about these things. It's just a way of sort of ordering your thoughts on like, what, which duty does this question fall under and where are the conflicts? And where's my personal position on this? The, the outcome will be very different. So, for example, when I presented uh, the two architects, you know, when I presented Zahadid, I'm sure people working at Zahadid's architects see this very differently. You know, their position is different. Um, and, and you will all have very different opinions on this. I'm not trying to tell anyone what ethical practice is. It's just a way of sort of thinking about it and making sense of your thoughts and trying to outweigh weighing them up against each other okay okay well um alisa thank you very much for this insightful webinar um i personally uh learned quite a bit from it uh, especially how you just uh interwoven the duties from 
itself and then with it all the way to the wider uh, society in the, uh, the globe rather um i don't know if you have any last uh, remarks or questions that you would like to uh, say before we uh, wrap up the webinar I mean, I'm really just, I'm, I'm, I'd be curious to hear if anybody has, please share my contact details. If anybody wants to get in touch about anything, I'm very much open. Um, uh, as I said, I think this global exchange is really important. And I would love to hear from you all whether you find this way of thinking about it useful. Um, and, you know, because this is something that the RBA is developing, but they're kind of looking globally at, at how other people are thinking about this. Um, so it's, it's it's just one of those um, uh, very complex issues that you can think about in a different way. So any feedback on this, I would love to hear. And and I really just wanted to say thank you for having me. Um, it's been a real pleasure to see you all. And I hope next time in Lesotho. Yes, you'd have to come. <laughs> no, <you'd... laughs> we need to see Absolutely. this side. Um, come by. Uh, but thank you very much. Okay. Um, and uh, to everybody that joined the webinar, thank you very much. We really appreciate your time during lunch hour. And uh, the next uh, uh, lecture series or webinar that we're going to be having is going to be on the 27th of April. And it's going to be at the Laboratory Polytechnic. So please do look out on our social media uh, who our guest will be and what the topic will be. And we look forward to seeing everybody there. Um, please do follow us on all our social media channels, uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And this webinar is going to be available uh, on YouTube. So please do share with everybody that was not uh, able to join, because uh, I really think it was insightful. And um, uh, I believe all the people that signed up uh, we have the, your emails, so if you're very much interested in connecting with Elisa, we'll uh, create that link and um, share this uh, recording with you, and perhaps even the the presentation, if that could be. Uh, yeah, of, I'll send of you the slides to, again. To a bit updated. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, thank you very much. I'll hand it over back to Teddy to just uh, close it up. All right, all right. Thank you so much, uh, Elisa. It's been a pleasure. Really appreciate your time. And for everyone for joining us um, uh, today. Uh, thank you all, and uh, have yourselves a great day. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks. Cool.